And I'm rambling a little bit, but there you go. I like Dark Souls. <laughs> Why, hello there. Welcome to The Hunt. Today's episode, I will be talking about Dark Souls 3, and I will be talking about the angels. So, the angels are sort of something from Dark Souls 3 that I've never totally understood and never really followed up on. And um, I wanted to take a look now, see if anything new has come out, and just better understand the angels in Dark Souls 3. So that is what I've decided to hunt down for this episode. And I, you know, one of the things is, is I've tried to, when I first played Dark Souls 3, I really enjoyed it. And I really enjoyed sort of it on, a, on an emotional, experiential level. And the lore seemed really interesting to me and I couldn't wait to see where the lore went. But the angels as an example is one of those things where it just doesn't seem like it really goes anywhere. And thematically, I don't think it's resonant enough. My, my sort of feeling on it is like things can be obscure and open-ended and not clear. If that is like contributing towards a feeling or a mood, or it's less about those details and it's more about the experience or the theme that it evokes, you know, see like Lynch as, as a, you know, someone who makes movies that the details like, you know, in Twin Peaks, I know a lot of people do like, deep lore stuff on Twin Peaks, but, and you can in a lot of ways, but it doesn't really matter because the feeling is still so resonant and so strong. And when you're watching it, you really feel something. And, you know, I think in Dark Souls 1, there's a lot of stories for me where they, they have open ends, they're sort of vague, but there's still that thematic core that feels, feels good and strong. And the details, the lack of details don't feel like they're getting in the way. And I feel like with Dark Souls 3, sometimes that didn't feel true to me and the angels are something where i wanted to revisit and give it another shot and just see so let's find out if my hunt has resulted in me uh learning more about the angels and um you know coming to better terms with it so some context for the angels in general is no matter which lore uh, supposition you're reading no matter which lore theory you're reading and I will bring up a few here they will be in the links below they will be linked at the top if possible and the angelic faith in Lothric was started by Gertrude and she was visited by an angel and it made her go like blind and mute but she wrote this like you know this she wrote this tome or whatever you call it for the miracle and that started started the angelic faith and a lot of people agree that the the angels are tied in some way to the way of white, whether it be a continuation or an opposition even in some theories, but it's sort of an extension of, of the way of white in some way. And the angels themselves are always very mysterious. And one thing that I've had trouble with on the hunt for this particular lore is that, you know, with the ringed city DLC, you have these enemies, the angels, and they come from the pilgrims, which are connected to Londor and the dark and I think that really messes with things a bit, but there is a theory that supports the angels being sort of for the dark. I think either way, um, you do have the basis of Gertrude, as I said, some connection to the way of white. And then the other thing is, is there's either a relationship with the light, you know, the fire, fire or dark and different theories go different ways. And I think that's sort of at the core where spoiler for my overall thoughts, I still think it's too muddy because thematically it doesn't, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to get out of it. Besides, it is interesting to have this like civil war internal conflict in Lothric between the winged, you know, you see the winged knights fighting the Lothric knights. You can see that in the courtyard down there in in uh, the wall of Lothric. And then later on, you, you'll continue to see evidence that, you know, um, Lothric and Lorien in the throne room at the top of Lothric Castle are most likely being barricaded, you know, and there's soldiers outside reinforcing it. It most likely is related to that civil war and conflict of the angelic faith versus Lothric. And so the first, so that's sort of the core of it. And getting into uh, the first sort of theory is one you've probably seen is uh, it's what Vadi Vidya has put forth. And I want to clarify that this video he made that I have linked, the angels of Lothric, 
This is pre the ringed city, so I don't know. He never followed up after that or, or anything to sort of talk more about that as far as I know. And um, so he doesn't include the angels, but I think it is possible to look at it without the ring city and still, I still think, again, a little bit of a spoiler, I still think Vadi's theory feels pretty good, even though it doesn't take into account the ringed city angels, because I think you could just say they're, it seems messy, but it feels messy too, honestly. Just don't include them, and then it feels pretty good. Once you include them, I think it gets pretty messy. It gets pretty hard to explain it in a way that feels believable, or that doesn't feel overly complicated, and still feels like resonant as a narrative. So, Vadi Vidya, basically his stance is that um, Prince Lothric is the current ruler of Lothric because the consumed king has gone mad. He's not really in power anymore. You find Lothric and Lorien in the throne room, indicating that he's sort of in power and that the three pillars, which are sort of at war against the angelic faith, the three pillars are the the knights, the scholars, and um, the priests, uh, that they are, they are under Lothric's power and he is sort of commanding them and telling them what to do. Not that anyone in Lothric really looks like they know what the hell is going on besides shambling around and trying to kill you. But, um, you know, they obviously set up barricades at one point and Vadi's putting forth that that's, you know, that they are opposed to the angelic faith. And in this case, the angelic faith is an extension of the way of white. And that because of the connection with Guinevere, which you can look at Vadi's video to get more information on, he, he puts forward the popular theory that Guinevere is the queen of Lothric and that she was sort of continuing the work that we saw in Dark Souls 1 with the illusion of her, where she's continuing to try and get more kindling. In this case, like her children, but her children rebelled. And the idea is that Guinevere pushed this angelic faith or she was a part of it somehow and that Gertrude, her daughter, was the, he the heavenly daughter that started the angelic faith and that Lothric, prior to the consumed king going mad and exiling himself, was very pro that and that when Lothric took over and refused to link the flame, that is at that point that the angelic faith and Lothric became heretical and that they were fighting against each other and that imprisoning his sister Gertrude was a big part of that and that um, Gertrude was imprisoned and then he puts forth that she became Rosaria that's not part of this video really but you can check out his video for more information on that but basically that her being imprisoned because Lothric said no we're not we're not pro the angelic faith because the angelic faith has sided with linking the flame and I'm not about that life because the scholars have talked with me and I have these three pillars behind me and we're against it now We've, we've, we, we've been swayed. So, um, that's the basic setup for Vadi's theory. And, um, he brings up something that I think is worth mentioning is that this is a similar dichotomy, similar to Berserk. Things that are portrayed as light and white are sort of perpetuating the status quo versus dark. Like, uh, Guts is the, uh, the black swordsman is sort of the good human side and that they're fighting against the status quo and gods and the uh, powers that be. So there's Vadi's theory. On the other hand, we have uh, the Ashen Hollow, who has two videos which are linked, uh, the Lothric Civil War, and then All Father Lloyd and the Angelic Faith. And the basic theory that the Ashen Hollow puts forth is that all Father Lloyd was part of the Way of White, and then he presents evidence about how he slowly was sort of ousted over time. Like, uh, Kareem really didn't like All Father Lloyd, and he sort of got put forth as this, this fake. And um, basically, Jake, in his video, he concludes that All Father Lloyd eventually flips sides and sort of revenge, like he turns against the linking the flame and the gods, and he pushes this angelic faith which he thinks is the dark and he uses the angels in the ringed city as an example that they're from the pilgrims of Londor and that um you know that the angels coming from these pilgrims must mean that it is part of the dark this doesn't necessarily address Guinevere and her spells but you can look more in his video to see how he he argues against that point and uh, but um he does talk about Rosaria and stuff and leaving and basically being betrayed by children again is, 
is a big portion of this. In this case, I believe he's putting forth that Guinevere is Rosaria. And uh, you can look at the video more for that because it's not really necessary to this topic to come to a conclusion. But basically that All Father Lloyd flipped sides and pushed this angelic faith and that he himself was the first angel. There you have that. You can check out Jake's video for sort of the, the opposite opinion there is that uh, the, the angelic faith actually has to do with the dark and that it has to do with uh, Londor's sort of agenda. And a third bit is that um, is a post from Reddit by the Spirit Force, user of the Spirit Force, and they put forth a pretty interesting and little bit out there theory that um, it, it's a post called Angels, Pilgrims, and the End of Time Launder maybe Lothric's future kingdom. And this is basically saying that, hey, isn't it weird how Londor never gets mentioned and that we see a lot of pilgrims and stuff at the drag heap and that only people from Londor talk about Londor? Their basic theory is that this is time travel, which may sound pretty out there at first, but I do like how it's sort of taking the convergence and it's taking the weird nature of space and time that is very present in Dark Souls 3 in doing something with that and saying these people are sort of coming from the future and because of the convergence they're being pulled you know toward this time with Lothric and um, that in this case that the angels we see in the drag heap are actually an earlier form of what would become the pilgrim butterflies and this is the only theory to really address the fact that the Londor pilgrims seem to become both these angels and these butterflies and the relationship between them is not really known but it definitely pushes the angels towards being part of the dark, as Jake also argued. And, you know, I like this theory. And then the one thing I come back to with this theory is just that there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And I think it does work with the themes of like this convergence and time, but just this very complicated narrative of Londor and time traveling. It just really complicates <laughs> um, what I think should be a more ideological conflict. And the fact that all these theories are on different sides and approaching what the angelic faith is differently, I think is a weakness in Dark Souls 3 for this. There may be a lot of references it's making and connections to things, but I don't I don't think it's a super strong theory because on a on like a on an emotional and an experiential level, you basically get the idea there was some internal conflict in Lothric. And it's hard to take it beyond that. And I think if it was more clear what side was talking about the dark and what side was talking about the light, that it would tie into the themes of the game more prevalently and would leave, you know, a larger mark if we just understood the strife of these sides more clearly. So I haven't really changed my opinion on this, but it was really fun to dive into this and just figure out what's going on. And I recommend looking at the videos and reading this, um, my friend Motown also did a video on Gertrude and the angelic faith in the Civil War, and um, you know I, w I recommend checking out all those videos. They're all linked, and um, I think it's just great to see these different things and different opinions. And that's something I like about Dark Souls. And even though I'm sort of t shitting on like the fact that it's so vague, it is cool to get these well thought out you know, thoughtful pieces that try to explain it. And um, I just think for me, it doesn't really land ultimately because I think this is a conflict that could have been thematically and narratively resonant and it ends up being too obscure to really factor in. And I think that is sort of a weakness of it. But, um, you know, check these out. Give me your thoughts on what you think about the angelic faith in Lothric and which theory you sort of subscribe to. Um, I sort of, I think Vadis makes sense for me personally that it just, you know, it doesn't include the DLC, but it, it just, it's the tidiest and it feels the most thematically resonant, as I've said quite a few times now. I just like that idea of the light, the angels being these figures of this continued status quo and how Lothric is fighting against them and how he doesn't want to be part of it. He's weak and frail and his brother Lorian was injured and it's all a part of this cycle and he's just tired of it and the world's tired and he just wants to let it go and um, I think if that was like just nailed a little stronger I think that, that it's, it's interesting to see that strife I think each kingdom in Dark Souls 3 does give that where you have the flame 
you know, the, the fire and the dark and Lothric. And then with Irithyll, you have, um, you know, the gods versus, you know, you have Pontiff Sullivan, and then you have the Way of Light turning on them with Aldrich and making the Deep and seeing another way out. They're all looking for the uh, these other ways out. No one is happy with what's happening, and I just think they're stronger when you feel them more. And I think, for instance, with Irithyll and the gods and Aldrich, it's just a little more obvious, and I think that's okay. The details there, there's plenty of cool details to suss out, but it's just a stronger theme. And also just the way you sort of visit Lothric in the first half, and then the second half, and then you have such an obscure sort of collection, and it just doesn't come together super strong, I think is a detriment to it. And if it was a little bit more straightforward story with more interesting details on the fringes, that um, it would have worked better. And that I think it's something you'd return to and you'd be excited about. And you'd make the connection, oh, each kingdom is looking at a different way out. You know, sort of like how Dark Souls 2, I think it's more obvious that each kingdom is dealing with the undead curse in different ways and trying to also find a way out, but it's just framed differently. I think Dark Souls 3 is a little bit more grand in the scale of its framing, where uh, Dark Souls 2 is, uh, it's a little bit more personal and it's dealing with the curse, versus Dark Souls 3 is really dealing with these big conceptual ideas of light and dark, and gods, humans, all this stuff coming together and um, just how these lords have abandoned their posts. And I'm rambling a little bit, but there you go. I like Dark Souls. <laughs> and even when I'm sort of complaining about it, they are compelling to think about. And um, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. So let me know, and uh, I will see you for the next hunt.